All right. Well, let's uh, let's learn about sleep. Right. That sounds exciting. We'll also talk a little bit about some biological rhythms as well. <clears throat> All right. So we want to think about what is sleep. Why do we sleep? Uh, what are some of the psychological or physiological mechanisms? We'll briefly talk about disorders of sleep where we need to, uh, but please don't get too bogged down with disorders of sleep, right? That, that may or may not be that important for you. And we'll talk a little bit about biological clocks as well. So that's going to be exciting. <clears throat> All right, so there's the brain. Uh, this is just showing you a couple uh, brain regions. One in particular we'll talk about today is the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Don't worry about that too much. So what is sleep, right? Uh, I think we can all sort of define sleep, at least in our own terms, right? We know what this is, but <clears throat> for our purposes, we want to think about a few things. Uh, one, sleep is, is definitely a behavior, right? We often uh, think about sleep as not a behavior. Uh, sleep is not the same as you being unconscious, right? So we want to make sure that we're, uh, we're aware of that. <clears throat> there is a ton of neurological activity going on while you sleep. A lot of important work is happening uh, while you're, uh, when you got your eyes closed, right, for whatever that two to like four and a half hours you get every night is, right? Jacob, that's about average. Yeah. Yeah. Because <clears throat> you have to spend, you know, like three and a half hours playing Red Dead Redemption 2, Jim, for probably four hours, yeah, right? Probably. And then uh, you might like eat a sandwich or something. That's going to take 15 minutes. So what are you left with? <clears throat> Just a little bit of that. So sleep is a behavior, a ton of stuff going on there. I recommend you all try to sleep more than you do, right? I'm just going to assume most of you don't sleep enough. So sleep more than you do, you'll be fine. Uh, and again, I love these definitions from the book. Uh, sleep is motivated by the insistent urge of sleepiness. Just in case you didn't uh, quite catch on to that right Abby, I mean, that was like, like a unique thing there. <clears throat> but uh, we might actually talk about what is that sleepiness? Why? Why does that urge occur, right? But we want to think about it on that biological level, not just, well, geez, I've been up for like three days and now I'm tired. But there's some uh, neurochemical things going on we want to think about, right? <coughs> One of the first things, though, we want to talk about are stages of sleep, right? How many of you have heard of different uh, stages of sleep, right? There's like slow-wave sleep, there's maybe deep sleep. Some folks have heard of uh, REM sleep, non-REM sleep, right? We'll talk about some of those, give you a few other things. If you really want to know uh, what stage of sleep someone is in, you really have to do some, uh, some important things, right? The first thing you do is you just wake them up and ask them. Right? This guy, you just like, shake him, hey, what stage of sleep are you in? They're like, oh, three. Uh, no, it doesn't really work that way, right? There are outward sort of measures of uh, physical activity, muscle tone, eye movements, obviously, and uh, brain activity as well. We're going to measure those things, right? So one of the first things is an electromyogram, right? EMG. Uh, you can put these uh, electrodes on or in your muscles. You can sort of measure muscle tone, right? Usually while you're asleep, you're not moving as much, right? And there are certain uh, stages of sleep where you should be paralyzed. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about what happens when that doesn't happen, why that is. So using that EMG, we can sort of figure out some things about which stage of sleep you're in. Another technique is the uh, electrooculogram. So we'll measure electrical potentials from around your eyes, right? This will help detect eye movements. So we've already talked about REM sleep. That's rapid eye movement sleep, right? And then there's non-REM sleep. So that's when your eyes aren't moving rapidly. So an easy way to tell if someone is in REM sleep is just determine if their eyes are moving, right? If your eyes are moving rapidly, then uh, you're probably in REM sleep, right? That's a no-brainer. Casey, you didn't get that pun. It's a no-brainer because we're just measuring the eye. It's not brain activity. Write that down. You're going to want to use that later. <clears throat> uh, so here's like a picture of a weird little kid uh, with a bunch of stuff taped to her face. Right? Maybe, maybe when you guys go to sleep tonight, this will like invade your dreams. I don't know. Because uh, they're never coming back to class. <coughs> uh, so this particular uh, individual, they've got some electrodes measuring muscle tone and some other things. Uh, anybody ever had a sleep study? You don't have to answer that question. Right? Some folks have had sleep studies for different reasons. Uh, they stick you in one of these weird rooms on a strange bed, take a bunch of stuff to your face and body, and say, hey, get a good night's sleep. Let's see if you have any trouble. Uh, surprisingly, they, they find you have some problems right there. I don't know. I'm going to try this tonight. I've got some wire at home. I'm just going to tape things to my face and see how well I sleep. 
All right. What we do need to think about, though, is uh, what is your brain doing, right? We've already talked about muscles briefly. We've talked about eyes. But what is your brain doing while you're asleep, right? And it's doing a lot of stuff, okay? How are we going to measure this? We're going to measure it using an EEG, right? Electroencephalogram. Most of you have heard of EEGs, right? They slap the electrodes on your head. They get some weird squiggly lines coming out on a screen. And they're going, hmm, well, your brain's doing something, right, Paris? So you must be okay. Uh, sometimes they'll give you these after a head injury. Uh, if you have some sort of other neurological complaint, right, you might get an EEG. But they use it during a sleep study. These EEGs are not measuring activity deep in your brain. They're really only measuring activity kind of on the surface of that cortex, right, that kind of outer wrinkly part of your uh, brain that, uh, that's doing some of that higher order thinking and so forth, right? So we're going to measure brain activity. Now, <clears throat> we're going to measure this. It's going to just look like waves like this, okay? That might be what your EEG activity looks like if you're awake, kind of hanging out, doing different things. What we're really looking for uh, to determine which stage of sleep you're in is how many of those cortical neurons are active at the same time and how many of them are not active at the same time, right? Because they're going to kind of go back and forth in these oscillations while you're asleep, right, Mary? Now, if you're awake, uh, I mean, if you're awake, the world's just coming at you in some random fashion, right? So there's not really a pattern to it, right? So your brain activity is just going to be this, like, random, these little spikes up and down. Whatever neurons need to be active will be active. Whatever ones don't need to be active won't be. And it's just going to vary over time. High frequency, small amplitude, right? doesn't mean your brain's not really active. It just means some of it's active, some of it's not. It's not really in sync because the world's not coming at you in sync, right? The world's coming at you in these, like, bits and pieces and uh, sort of whatever weird pattern it has. Now, as you get into deeper sleep, what happens <clears throat> is you disconnect from the world more and more and more, right? So, Blakely, you can start to get your neurons synchronized, right? And instead of these, like, small, squiggly waves like this, you start to get sort of bigger waves, right? <clears throat> and you get bigger, slower waves. So it's a lower frequency, uh, but it's higher amplitude. What that means is more of your neurons are firing at the same time, more of them are taking a break at the same time. Firing at the same time, taking a break at the same time, right? Because we've synchronized everything because it's no longer connected to the outside world. You know, you're sort of unplugged, you're just taking a nap there, okay? <clears throat> so we're going to go through each of these stages. We're going to talk about sort of that, uh, that EEG reading, right? Whether it's, we call this uh, asynchronous. And we would say that this is synchronized, right? Because more neurons are firing at the same time, and then they're not firing <clears throat> back and forth like that. <clears throat> I'm not going to expect you to know uh, specific sort of uh, frequencies in each of these stages of sleep, but I want you to know the general pattern of how these frequencies move, right? How we're moving through stages of sleep and how the frequencies and the amplitudes are changing as we do that. Is that cool? All right, so if you're awake, which I'm assuming most of you are, uh, hopefully, hopefully, most of you are in this beta activity range, right? It means you're kind of awake, you're attentive, you're doing the business. You've got this very irregular sort of EEG pattern, 13 to 20 hertz, right? So relatively fast. You're just firing your cortical cells when they need to fire. This information's flying into you, right? You're absorbing that. Okay. Some of you, despite my best efforts, might slip into this alpha activity, right? It happens, it's that relaxed activity, you're getting a little bit smoother, <clears throat> right? This is when you're sitting on the couch, you're kind of relaxing a little bit, maybe you space out for a few moments, I don't know if that's happened to anybody before, right? Somebody said, hey, were you asleep? And you're like, no, no, I wasn't asleep. Uh, but you weren't really active and aroused and kind of in the environment, right? You're just kind of sitting there hanging out. It's a little bit slower, 8 to 12 hertz, right? You're just kind of relaxed, okay? Now, from there, we would move into what we call stage 1 sleep, right? We get something called theta activity. You know, you're talking about something maybe 3.5 to 4 hertz. Starting to get some synchronization, starting to slow down a little bit, higher amplitudes, right? You're starting to generally sort of unplug from the environment. From there, we move into stage 2. 
Stage two has a couple interesting features. Uh, one of these is called a sleep spindle, right? You'll get a rapid burst. So even though you're kind of moving along slow, all of a sudden you'll get a rapid burst of activity, right? Not a big deal. You also have something called a K-complex, right? What we're trying to do in stage two is really click over Leanne into this really slow wave sleep, right? So you got these medium-sized waves that are just coming along, and all of a sudden you get a big sort of slow wave will fit in there, right? Okay. Because later we want to get into that slow wave sleep, that deep sleep, because we've got some business we need to take care of there. Guess what comes after stage two? Stage three, I know, right? Very creative. Okay, so just, just hang in there. Uh, so you go into stage three. We get something called delta activity here. <clears throat> this is when your frequency is going to be less than four hertz. Now, the big difference between stage three and stage four is how much delta activity you have, right? As you move to stage four, more than 50% of your EEG reading is going to be delta activity, right? Compared to less than that for stage three. So what we see here is sort of a steady progression, right? From high frequency, low amplitude, to this low frequency, high amplitude, right? Because that's something that's not synchronized to activity that is synchronized because we're, no uh, we're no longer getting information from the outside world, right? All of this information is just going to be what's going on internally. <clears throat> Stage four is sometimes called slow wave sleep. Sometimes we'll abbreviate that uh, SWS. Also known as non-REM sleep. Sort of everything we've talked about so far is non-REM sleep, right? REM sleep is going to be the second sort of separate uh, category of, of brain activity that we'll talk about in a few moments. Okay. Any questions? Because this is actually pretty important. So as we're going into deeper sleep, right? We get slower frequency, okay? but we get higher amplitudes. And that's because brain activity is more synchronized. All the neurons are firing together, and then they're not firing. And then they're firing together, and then they're not firing, right? Whereas it's going to be desynchronized for the lower, or uh, like when you're awake, right? Neurons are just firing when they need to. Uh, in stage four, more than 50%, what is more than 40, 50%? Uh, that's the delta activity. That's that, uh, that's that really low frequency, less than 4 hertz activity. So in stage 3, it's less than, five, less than 50% delta activity? Yeah, usually somewhere around 20 to 50% is going to be delta activity. Once you cross over that 50% threshold, you're going to be in stage 4. Right? And I think, Megan, that just really highlights sort of the continuous nature of this, right? <coughs> As you're going uh, from asynchronous to synchronize, you know, it's kind of a steady progression, right? It's on a continuum. <clears throat> All right, so here's an example of an EEG recording. Uh, this is going to be something where we are um, firing at random, right? All those messages are just doing whatever they need to do. They're handling that information. It's going to be while someone is awake. Right? Here in trace A, much slower, right? This is probably like a stage uh, four, right? Okay, look at all that nice, those nice slow waveforms, right? So if we were to count these peaks, we're not talking about that many peaks. If we count the peaks here, you've got all kinds of peaks. So it's higher frequency, low amplitude, asynchronous, right? Here we have a low frequency, high amplitude, synchronized. Does that make sense to everybody? <clears throat> all right, again, all of that was in the non-REM sleep category. Once you get into REM sleep, we have some other uh, business going on. So REM sleep looks very much like awake uh, EEG recordings, right? We get a lot of beta activity, which is exactly what we would see sort of in that, uh, you know, that awake state, right? 
So the EEG recording from someone who is in REM sleep is going to be nearly identical to someone who's awake. Right? Their eyes are going to be moving around rapidly, just like your eyes are moving now. The difference is uh, someone who's in REM sleep should be paralyzed, right? <coughs> and the reason that we want that person paralyzed, this doesn't happen all the time, but the reason we want them paralyzed is because they're having a dream, possibly, uh, about doing some activity, and their brain is sort of reflecting that activity. And if there's not a disconnect between those motor commands coming out, that individual will get up and do those things, whatever they are, right? Which is fine. You might think, well, that would be interesting, right? What if someone was dreaming they cleaned my house? I think, well, that would be awesome. They could clean my house in their sleep, and everything would be fine, right? I wake up, I have a clean house, and I've got less work to do. The problem is, again, you're not really getting information from the outside world coming in, right? And so what if you think you're cleaning uh, the kitchen, but in fact you're cleaning... Uh, you know, the garage or something, right? And you can really, you know, I don't know, cause some problems, start a lawnmower, you know, slice a toe, I don't know, things happen. Uh, so it can happen. Uh, you may not even be thinking you're in the, your house. You may be somewhere else, right? Likely, what if you were, uh, you know, dreaming about a softball game and you were inside your house and you, like, jumped up and you, like, grabbed, I don't know, what you have in your bedroom, a lamp, and you thought it was a bed, you swung it, Right, you bust it out a window. You can see where this becomes a problem. Right, so thankfully uh, most folks are paralyzed while they're in REM sleep. Now there is a, a disorder where folks don't get paralyzed. They'll get up and they'll do things. This is different than sleepwalking. <clears throat> right, so folks will get up and they'll do um, all kinds of weird things, including kill people. Uh, yeah, I know, right, Megan? So uh, that's actually it's been successful. I wouldn't recommend this. So I, I did, typically don't recommend killing people sort of like that's my general approach to life. Is there a uh, legal precedent? There is a legal precedent for using uh, sleep disorders, certain sleep disorders, to get out of uh, certain uh, crimes. There was a guy a few years ago who killed his in-laws. He like got in his car, drove to his in I know, right? Drove to his in-laws house and stabbed both of them while they were asleep. Went back home and went to sleep. I mean, it was like still asleep the whole time, right? I know, that's pretty crazy. Uh, and he uh, actually was acquitted uh, because they were able to demonstrate that he had a severe sort of sleep disorder that... So they just like, someone handcuffs him to his bed every night? Like you know, I don't know. I, I would assume that's what I would do, right? I think if I had this problem, I would try to like tie myself to my bed or have someone like come check on me, you know, like every night and it's like I'm waking up in the morning or whatever. Um, so there you go, yeah. It's pretty serious. This is, this is more serious. Some of you may share a bed with someone who is, uh, they kind of toss and turn a little bit, right? Uh, this is much more serious than that, right? That can be easily remedied, you know, with like a quick kick in the leg. Uh, it usually works, just as a heads up there. Um, you can check people's legs for bruises and see if they're the, the, the person who moves in, in their sleep or not, right? Uh, so, it's a quick, easy way to tell. But uh, rim, uh, folks who aren't paralyzed during, during REM sleep, that's actually a pretty severe sort of situation. I think they do things. Completely different than sleep eating disorder, right? I know somebody's going to ask me about sleep eating disorder. Who wants to ask that one? Nobody. Uh, so sleep eating disorder is a different situation. Folks will wake up, they'll get in their refrigerator, and they'll just like start eating things, uh, which creates two sorts of problems. One, you might eat things that aren't properly prepared, right? So if you just go and like, start scooping out raw meat, that doesn't sound like a good idea. The other thing is you can be really disturbed the next day when you go in and your turkey sandwich is gone. Um, and you think someone broke into your house in the middle of the night and took your turkey sandwich. Uh, and you get really, because I mean, you might have had like a nice slice of tomato and some smoked gouda on there on a nice, you know, two pieces of rye bread. Somebody takes that, you're going to get pretty upset, right? So uh, sleep eating disorder, that's sort of a, a problem as well. Completely different than folks who aren't paralyzed in this. Also completely different than uh, like folks who sleepwalk. Probably some of you have uh, done some sleepwalking before. Seems to be fairly common in like uh, boys who are like seven to 12 years old, right? They'll tend to like get up and like say and do weird things and they go back to sleep or go back to bed. They're sort of asleep the whole time. They'll grow out of that too. Do you have any idea how like different sleeping medications like Ambien can affect that? Because I know it can cause sleep eating and sleepwalking. Yeah, so, so I, 
yeah, try to stay off the ambient if you can. I mean, that's just it's just like a general guideline. I know some folks need it. That's fine. Anytime you start, so we'll talk in a little bit about uh, some of the chemical signals that control sleep and the different brain regions involved. The problem is this is a very complex and coordinated behavior, right? And, and I think people don't think about it. It's like, I'm just going to sleep. So I'm going to sleep. I do it every day. Been doing it for decades. I'm pretty good at it, right? Uh, but there are a ton of chemicals. And when you start like dialing around with one and, and maybe not others, then you turn on or off certain of these brain networks and circuits. And, and that's, that can be problematic because we don't have a great way of sort of adjusting everything in the right direction all at once. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. so we'll get into some details on that hopefully in a few months. So when people are sleepwalking, what stage are they in? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, should they have those electrodes you can just like strap to someone and then just like look at? Yeah, it? I, I, don't, I don't. I'm not familiar with that research. That sounds interesting. We should try it. Uh, I would guess they're probably, uh, possibly stage one or, or REM sleep. When you're in these other sort of stages, you're you're, you know, you're pretty well synchronized a lot, and I, I wouldn't imagine as much going on there. So. Sleepwalking, like some people don't remember sleepwalking, some people do. Yeah. Like different stages. I, I think it probably would. It would depend on, and so we'll talk in a few moments about how you sort of you pop in and out of these stages of sleep overnight, right? And sometimes you pop into waking. And I think if you were to, you know, if you're here at, at REM sleep or even here in stage one, you can pretty quickly get to that uh, awake state, right? And I think if you were to get into one of those states pretty quickly, maybe even into that, uh, you know, we already talked about sort of that relaxed state, right? Um, if you were to get into sort of this alpha activity while you were up moving around, then you could probably have some uh, remembrance of what was going on. If you were in these deeper sleep, I, I, I can't imagine that you would recall what was going on unless you briefly sort of, you know, popped out of that into one of these other, into this sort of awake stage briefly. Is this where the stages come from? Oh, I've not seen that movie in a long time. I haven't really thought about that. That is a much more important question, right? Yeah, I'll have to watch that movie again. I'll let you know. I, I wouldn't have thought of it, but I'd certainly watch it again. Yeah. yeah, it's always good to revisit Michael Caine's body of work. Isn't it? Yeah. Except most, most people forgot Michael Caine was in that movie, right, Casey? Casey. Hey, so uh, this looks like a, like a, I don't know, a city skyline, right? It's not. This is what you should do. This is that mythical unicorn person who sleeps eight hours a night, right? I'm pretty sure they don't exist. Because I think some of you sleep four and the rest of you sleep 12, right? I think that's, that's where most people are. Is that right, Abby? Yeah. You know some people in that 12 category, right? You might be in that category. I don't know. It's okay. So, uh, over the course of the night, you start out awake, obviously. You're going to go through these stages of sleep, kind of up and down. What I want you to take away from this is sort of the pattern of this sleep, right? As you progress through the night, your REM sleep bounce should get longer, right? So you're going to spend more at one time in REM sleep, right? Uh, and you're going to go into deep sleep less often, right? So you're going to get into deep sleep pretty early. You're going to stay down there for a little bit. And then from then on, you're going to kind of stay in those, uh, you know, that uh, stage two, maybe stage three sleep at the deepest, right? So you're going to constantly be kind of moving up and down throughout the night. Eventually, you're going to go, whoa, I'm awake, ready to go through my day and uh, start this process over. How many of you have ever... Uh, uh, there's a thing called uh, sleep rebound, right? You guys familiar with sleep rebound? This is kind of interesting. We'll talk about it a little bit now and a little bit later. Uh, if you stay up, like let's say, hey, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to sleep tonight. I'm going to do two days at once. That sounds great, right? Uh, so you're just going to stay up all night. And that happens, right? Uh, what happens the following day, right? Or the, or the following few days, in fact. Actually, if you give yourself the opportunity, you'll actually sleep a little bit longer than normal, right? So if you stay up a whole night, 
and you don't sleep and you are this person who sleeps normally eight hours when you go to sleep the next night you might sleep 12 hours right the next night after that you might sleep nine or ten hours and then after two or three nights you'll get back to that normal eight hour sort of uh, sequence that's called sleep rebound right you try to recover some of that sleep that you lost while you uh, while you try to stay awake for that time what's really interesting about this is there's also a separate sort of mechanism just for REM sleep. So here's a fun project you can do at home. Uh, first, you need to get some electrodes taken to someone's face. Uh, who doesn't mind if you like stand over top of them all night while they sleep? Always ask for permission before you do this. Uh, wait until they get into REM sleep and wake them up. Right? As soon as they go into REM sleep, just wake them up. Just go ahead, just go ahead and wake them up, Paige. Uh, and then just let them go back to sleep. But every time they get in to REM sleep, wake them up. So they don't get REM sleep. They get all their other stages of sleep, but they don't get REM sleep, right? What happens the next night, let's say you decided to be nice this time, you're just gonna let them actually do their normal sleep. They'll actually start spending more time in REM sleep, right? Than they spend uh, in some of those other sort of sleep stages. So they'll extend their REM sleep. Uh, proportionally, right? So they'll try to recover REM sleep, even though they had the right amount of normal sleep, and right? it was like a normal eight hours, they'll still try to recover REM sleep. So REM sleep and slow wave sleep are actually doing two different things, right? There are two different mechanisms going on. We'll talk about what those are uh, here in a few moments. So you need both of these. You've got two different mechanisms that control this, right? This would be pretty cool. All right, uh, so again, here are some characteristics of uh, REM sleep versus slow wave sleep, right? I think we covered most of those. We didn't talk about genital activity, but it's something you can think about if you want to. Anybody read the book and the interesting story about the roll of stamps? Nobody read about the roll of stamps. That's a fun one. I know about it. You know about it? Who said that? Autumn? Is it? Where they used to do it, they don't do it like that anymore. No, they, I mean, I, I think because they don't sell stamps and rolls, I don't know. Uh, do they sell stamps and rolls still? Anybody work at the post office? I worked at a grocery store and they don't. They don't sell them in rolls, okay. So previously, uh, they used to sell stamps and rolls, right? And so you had like a stamp and it had this little like perforated edge. That's a great looking stamp, right? Okay, and it came in like a giant roll, right? And you just had to like lick it and you like stick it on stuff. And you would, tear off the perforations, right, and stick them there. Um, nobody in this room is going to own up to experiencing any of these problems. But um, if you ever get to the point where you've got to figure out if your erectile dysfunction is either physical or psychological, right, here's an easy way to do it so you know which doctor to go to first. Uh, get a roll of stamps and stick them to yourself at night. Um, if you wake up and they're perforated, then you know the biological part works, uh, then it's a psychological issue. So there you go. Sa save you a trip to one doctor. Right? Although now with the way stamp prices are, it might be cheaper to just go to both. <laughs> I don't know. And if they're not in perforations, it's not going to work if they're separate stickers, right? So if you kind of think about it a little bit, they're not going to like rip apart because they're already apart. There you go. Nobody's going to think about paying their bills the same again, are they? You guys use stamps at all? For regular purposes. Yeah, some people still use stamps, okay. Uh, let's see, we don't need to see this slide. Why do we sleep? Oh man, that's a great question. Uh, there's actually this interesting, you guys might not think it's interesting, but there's an interesting competition they have every year. It's like a, uh, like a science comedy competition where folks take actual science articles and kind of like make that into some kind of hilarious theory. Uh, and there was one that came in second place a couple years ago the idea is why we sleep is it's the only way to get away from our own consciousness, right? So we have to sleep to escape ourselves. Uh, most other people you can just walk away from. I don't know if you've ever tried to walk away from yourself. It's a fast way to pull your groin. Uh, try to go in two directions at the same time. It's going to be painful. So uh, why do we sleep, though? Or why do we actually sleep? Again, what's important is to know that sleep is not being unconscious. That's something different, right? Some of you may have been unconscious before. Some of you may have been hit in the head with something. Um, sure, you don't remember it, but your friends do. Uh, some of you may have been anesthetized for a medical procedure, right? Uh, some of you may have been abducted by aliens. They'll anesthetize you as well, right? That happens. 
So, why uh, do we sleep, right? There is this mental activity going on during both REM and slow waves. It's important stuff. <clears throat> What's kind of cool is all vertebrates sleep, right? How many of you have a dog or a fish, a turtle? It sleeps, right? They all sleep. What's really sort of interesting about that is that only warm-blooded vertebrates actually have REM sleep, uh, including that muscle paralysis, that uh, desynchronization of their EEG, and rapid eye movements, right? So that means your turtle, if you have a pet turtle, doesn't have REM sleep because it's not a warm-blooded vertebrate, right? So it has some other kind of sleep thing going on, not necessarily REM sleep. So if we want to think about REM sleep, we're thinking about things like mammals, birds, you know, those are kind of the big guys that actually have uh, slow waves. So if you have a pet parrot, right, and it goes to sleep, its eyes are probably just moving around uh, while it's asleep at some point, right? Anybody have a pet bird? Nobody's owning up to that. I know you all have parakeets at home. <clears throat> all right, so what do we know about sleep uh, deprivation? What don't we know about sleep deprivation? Well, what we have found is that sleep may or may not be important for your normal body function, right? If you're not sleeping, your organs will still kind of, for a while at least, continue to do their normal business, right? Uh, however, we do know that it is very detrimental to your cognitive abilities, right? Folks who get a good night's sleep do better on exams. You guys should remember this in a couple weeks, right? If you don't know it the night before the exam, staying up is not going to help you, right, Casey? What should they do? Go to sleep. <clears throat> get a good night's rest, you'll do better uh, the next day when you come in here. So always get a good night's sleep every night, but definitely before exams. Uh, we already talked about rebound sleep. There's actually uh, significant evidence now indicating that uh, sleep deprivation, like over the course of your life, can lead to uh, an increased likelihood in developing Alzheimer's disease, right? And so we'll talk about that. Yeah, so while you're asleep, one of the main things that's going on is uh, there are mechanisms that are cleaning up your brain, right? During the day, there's a lot of cellular debris that's created, right? This stuff, just junk, just kind of lying around your cells as your brain's like cooking away, doing all of its business. When you go to sleep, there are mechanisms that come in, they clean up that debris. Dylan, if you leave that debris in there, it helps create those, uh, you know, those tangles and those plaques and things that really uh, are, are hallmarks of Alzheimer's disorder. So get a good night's sleep so you can remember what you're doing when you're older. You've got plenty of time now to correct your behavior, right? Hey, who loves dolphins? All right. Be proud about that. Dolphins are, there you go. Thank you. So dolphins are cool. Uh, dolphins have a really interesting way of sleeping too, right? Uh, they all sleep on water beds. <laughs> That's not true. Some of them like the spring mattresses. Uh, what's really cool about dolphins is they sleep one hemisphere at a time, right? They only sleep one side of their brain at a time. The other side is awake, right? And this is because what, what do you have that dolphins don't have, seriously? You have a bed. Dolphins don't have beds, right? Also, there's something trying to eat a dolphin all the time, right? Okay. Hopefully that's not happening to you. Hopefully there's some breaks from that. So, there's a dolphin swimming around. It has to keep moving, right? It has to keep going up, getting some air, and going back down, evading predators. So it's only going to sleep one hemisphere at a time. <clears throat> so here we go. Here's a dolphin. The left and the right hemisphere both are awake. We get that normal. That's the EEG reading that we would anticipate, right? High frequency, low amplitude. Says things are desynchronized, right? We're just responding to the environment as it's coming at us. Okay. This dolphin said, hey, I'm going to sleep my right hemisphere first. So what do they do? They start putting their right hemisphere to sleep, keep their left hemisphere awake, move through those sleep stages, and then they just flip, right? Now the left hemisphere is going to sleep and the right hemisphere is going to be awake. What about sharks? What they about the sharks? Because, like, don't they, like, never stop moving before? Like, yeah, I would assume sharks would do something similar uh, as, a, as a fish and not a mammal. Again, going back to that, like, you know, cold-blooded vertebrates have a completely different sort of sleep thing going on. It would be really kind of hard to, to compare that. Uh, but that's sort of, a, uh, of an interesting question. If you want to study that, I would, I would recommend being careful how you put the electrodes on a shark, but otherwise, I think you'll be fine. <clears throat> so dolphins not get like lack of debris in the brain? Is 
you know, I don't know that anybody's done an Alzheimer's study on dolphins. Uh, and I, I think that would be really interesting. I think it's really expensive. Uh, and, and I also think, like, some people are going to get upset about that, right? Like, like, like whacking like old dolphins, dolphins and pulling out their the right. It's quite possible, right? Yeah. Like, they, they've always had the ability to, like, clean one hemisphere at a time. You could be doing that right now, right? Just go, you'll need the right hemisphere for a couple hours. Let me just put that on auto clean. You know, pull the dishes out of the dishwasher later, and you're good. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, Mary, that's an interesting question. I don't think there are a lot, here's the problem, there aren't a lot of captive dolphins, right? And so what we could do is instead of just like killing the dolphins and just wait until they die, because you know, dolphins do die, it happens all the time. Uh, we could wait until a dolphin dies and then like pull its brain out and take a look at it. Well, that would be fun. Uh, but I don't know. Dolphins are interesting, right? You know, they all have names, uh, like for themselves. So they, they, they like scream their own names as they're coming up on other dolphins. So they have these like, you know, these sounds they make, right? And so each one kind of like screams its own sound as it's approaching other dolphins. It's like, here's Charles. Uh, and it's just like coming right at you. Uh, now they don't seem to really use each other's names, right? So they just kind of scream their own. It's kind of like their theme song, right? There's like arriving on the scene. And it's kind of like, here's their noise that they make. It's kind of interesting. So do they have contralateral movements in there? Brain, so like how do yeah. you sleep a part of your brain if you need it to control movement on that side? Well, of the so the nice thing about a dolphin is, right, they're all pretty well, I mean, they swim a circle, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> I, I mean, their tails are going up and down, right, not side to side, so you can imagine just like moving one side, it's kind of, those legs just kind of flopping. And one eye will close. So not only do dolphins do this, but ducks do it as well, right? Uh, ducks, again, being, um, warm-blooded, right, so they kind of have like regular sleep like we do. So ducks will also sleep one hemisphere at a time. The cool thing about ducks, when they do this, like some of the ducks, they typically like, they'll, they'll get a bunch of ducks like in the middle like this, right, and then they'll have ducks going around the edge. Because ducks also have to constantly be watching for something, right? And what these ducks will do is they'll sort of sleep the uh, hemisphere that's on the outside Right, so they keep their outer eye open because it is contralateral control, right? So they'll sleep the hemisphere that's got the eye to the inside here, and then they can still keep a watch on what's going on on the outside. So they'll have the ducks like swim around. And these ducks in the middle, like they'll sleep both hemispheres at the same time, and then they'll kind of rotate in and out and they'll swim in the other direction so they can sleep the other hemisphere later. There you go, anybody have a pet duck? Really? That's exciting. So watch it when it sleeps, like see if one eye's open or not, right? Just kind of check it. <clears throat> you can sneak up on a duck. All right, other questions about, about that? That's kind of interesting. <clears throat> All right, uh, so slow wave sleep, definitely important. Uh, it reduces free radicals, right? I don't want you to worry too much about what free radicals are. Just keep eating your blueberries and you'll be fine. Um, but these are guys that definitely uh, will fly through your cells and cause some damage, right? So that's bad. Uh, there is this thing called fatal familial insomnia. Please do not have a freak out because someone's going to go, oh, I can't sleep at night. I'm an insomnia. That's probably not true, right? The odds that any of you have insomnia is like incredibly small, right? All of us have experienced times when we've had difficulty sleeping. That's perfectly normal. Just deal with it and move on. Uh, this is a particularly uh, sort of nasty disorder that's inherited. Um, you get this progressive insomnia right over time. Usually once you're diagnosed with this disorder, you've got about six months until you die. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Uh, you actually start to have a breakdown of a lot of your endocrine function. Your autonomic nervous system gets out of whack. You also constantly feel like you're sort of in this weird dreamlike state, right? Because you're like, you should be going to sleep, but you're not, but you can't. There's some real problems. <clears throat> uh, what about REM sleep? Definitely promotes, promotes uh, brain development, facilitates learning. We already talked about that rim rebound phenomenon. All right, and there's your fatal familial insomnia. And we talked about sleep rebound and rim rebound specifically. Ah, here we go. So, sleep definitely helps you take long-term memories and turn them into, uh, you know, those important things that you want to hang on to. So. 
really that consolidation process is aided. We don't know much about consolidation yet. We'll learn about that in a few weeks. Right? But basically, we're going to take a short-term memory and we're going to turn it into a long-term memory so you can access that at a later time. That's important. So what I would recommend is after this class, just go home and take a nap. Right? See? It's a bright idea. How many of you do that? Yeah, I'll know how many of you do it when I grade your exams in a couple weeks. <clears throat> then go, these are the nap folks. And then down here are the folks who stayed up all night the night before. So you can definitely tell there's a difference. Uh, what's interesting about this is REM sleep and slow wave sleep actually help you with two different kinds of memory. Now, again, we don't really know what these kinds of memory are, and I'm not going to ask you about them. I'll ask you in a few weeks. But REM sleep helps with something called non-declarative memory, and slow wave helps with something called declarative memory. So for this particular class, Casey, do you have a recommendation on whether they should try to get REM sleep or slow wave sleep? Because we wanted help probably with declarative memory. Right? So probably getting into slow wave sleep is going to help you guys out the most, right? So you don't have to take a long nap after class, just enough to get into slow wave sleep, right? You can pop back up and do your business the rest of the day. <clears throat> and here's a nice graph basically showing you um, what I just talked about, right? These are some folks who were able to take either a 90-minute nap uh, that had slow wave sleep or a nap that had slow wave and REM sleep or no nap. What you see is those folks who were able to get slow wave sleep and REM sleep had a massive uh, improvement on this particular memory task. Right? Uh, here's one for declarative and non-declarative memory. Again, the story to take home is folks who got a nap uh, were better at that declarative memory task. So the difference between declarative and so we'll get into a lot of details on that later, but declarative, the example they use here is like words, right? So they'll give you like a list of words and you have to tell me which ones were paired up before. So that's pretty good. Yeah, you can tell me what that is, right? Non-declarative is where they learned, uh, in this case it was a mirror tracing task. It's a pretty common task uh, in psychological research. So you'll have a mirror and then you'll have some sort of thing you have to trace and you can't see your actual hand, right? So you can only see the reflection in the mirror and you have to try, to try to trace that object while looking in the mirror. So that's not, a, you're learning how to do something and you're remembering how to do it, but it's not something you can really declare to me that you can do, right? I mean, you can say, yes, I can trace something by looking in the mirror, but what we'll do is we'll measure your performance. It's kind of like, a, you, I'm sure played the game Operation. Probably go and play it every night and pull out the funny bone. I don't know. That's fine. Uh, so there's like, a, you'll have like a metal stylus and if you vary off of this path, it'll bam, bam, and it'll just like keep track of all your errors. Casey, do we have one of these devices here? Do you know if we have one of those mirror tracing setups? Sure. Hmm. We should get one. You should make one. <clears throat> you need a mirror, a piece of metal, a car battery, and a, a piece of paper with a black line on it. Does that make sense, Megan? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> right. So, any questions about that? Great. So let's talk a little bit about how we control sleep, right? What are the mechanisms of sleep and waking? Definitely going to be talking about the chemical control of sleep. While you are awake, you're constantly producing some kind of substance. We'll talk about what that is in a moment. That's going to promote sleep, right? And as you build up enough of that substance, it's going to overwhelm your other brain mechanisms that are keeping you awake. Okay? And it's going to make you go to sleep. While you're asleep, you'll destroy that substance. Okay? This, is a no, uh, this is pretty simple. The longer you're awake, the longer you need to sleep so that you can deactivate that substance, right? That makes sense. If you're awake longer, you're going to produce more of that byproduct, you need to sleep longer to destroy that byproduct. <clears throat> that product is adenosine. Okay. Adenosine is a byproduct of a ton of cellular mechanisms, right? And active cells like your neurons are going to create a bunch of adenosine. As that adenosine builds up, it's going to overwhelm some other things we'll talk about in a few moments. 
Once that adenosine level gets high enough, you'll fall asleep. So there you go. It's pretty simple, right? We do want to think about something called a flip-flop. Right. This is a concept that basically says it's one or the other. You cannot simultaneously be awake and asleep. Okay? You're either awake or you're asleep. And we have something called mutual inhibition. <clears throat> we'll talk about it in a few moments. These brain regions that control sleep and wake, when one is active, it will inhibit the other. When that one becomes active, it will inhibit the first one, right? And so only one can be on at a time. So you can't turn on both. You can't turn off both, right? I mean, I guess at some point, both will turn off, but and that's called death, so that's a later, that's a later thing. All right. There's adenosine, right? We already talked about that. All right. So here is sort of why caffeine. How many of you have ever taken caffeine? Yeah. How many of you are taking caffeine right now? What I thought. Um, what, why, do you, why do you ingest caffeine? All the cool kids do it, right? Uh, you do it to stay awake, typically, right? It's like, well, I'm getting sleepy. I'm going to take some caffeine. So how does caffeine actually work, and how does that keep you awake, right? Well, it actually is pretty cool because it actually blocks these adenosine receptors. So as your cells are doing their business, whatever that is they're doing throughout the day, right, your brain cells are just cooking away. Uh, you're doing some math. You're doing, you know, whatever. English class you have, whatever you're doing, walking around, eating a hot dog, I don't know what you do. Uh, you're building up adenosine, right? Your adenosine receptors are receiving that, okay? Not a big deal. <clears throat> Once that gets built up high enough, you go to sleep. During slow wave sleep, we're going to destroy that adenosine. Not a problem. If you want to stay up, sort of extend that wakefulness period, you take caffeine and block these adenosine receptors so they can't uh, receive adenosine. Okay. You'll go, hey, even though there's a lot of adenosine, I'm not getting that signal because the caffeine's blocking it, so I'll stay up longer. Okay, that seems to work. Now, there's a limit to caffeine, right? Like, caffeine can only keep you awake for so long. And eventually, uh, your adenosine levels are going to overwhelm that caffeine, and they're going to trigger this um, receptor anyway. Okay, so you can only use caffeine for a while. Makes a lot of sense, right? <clears throat> All right. Now we do have about five neurotransmitters that we want to talk about that are going to help us control sleep. Okay. Some of these you've probably heard of. We've talked about at least three of these before. Acetylcholine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. We've not talked about histamine or orexin. Okay. Orexin you've probably not heard of. How many of you have heard of histamine? Yeah, how many of you have taken Benadryl? Yeah, it's called antihistamine, right? How many of you take Benadryl and you fall asleep? Yeah. Okay. So there you go. So histamine is important to keep you awake. When you block that histamine, uh, you start to get sleep for most folks. There are some exceptions there. All right, so acetylcholine is important, right? Because it produces cortical desynchronization. Okay. A lot of this is coming from cortex and hippocampus. We'll talk about hippocampus in a few weeks when we talk about learning and memory. Basic idea is while you're awake, you've got fairly high levels of acetylcholine coming out of your cortex. When you're asleep, you have lower levels, right? REM sleep, interestingly, you sort of have an uptick again in acetylcholine levels. We said REM sleep is very similar to being awake. You just have that body paralysis, right? Okay, so your neural activity is going to be similar. If neural activity is similar, then the neurochemicals that are floating around should be similar to while you're awake. Okay. This is a rat brain cut in half. This is sort of showing you some of the major uh, uh, sources of acetylcholine, right? You can see where this goes to the cortex. We have stuff in the hippocampus, a few other places, like the amygdala. 
Uh, and then you've got some brain stem regions as well. Brain stem, uh, we're not going to get into a lot of details on this, but brain stem controls a lot of those body functions, right? Heart rate, breathing, uh, other, other sort of movements and so forth. A lot of that gets uh, control from the uh, brain stem and something to serve well. All right, what about norepinephrine, right? It's coming out of the locus ceruleus, which means the blue place. Why do they call it the blue place? If you cut open someone's brain, slice through, it looks like a blue spot. It's a very creative name. Uh, you said there was another name for norepinephrine, right? Anybody remember what that name was? It was noradrenaline, right? It was similar to adrenaline. So if you think about an adrenaline rush, how many of you have ever been asleep during the middle of an adrenaline rush? Doesn't happen, does it? So if you've got uh, high, High levels of norepinephrine going on, you're not going to uh, be falling asleep. Again, uh, a lot of these projections are going to places like the cortex, the hippocampus, uh, and some other regions that we just talked about. Here is uh, norepinephrine during the sleep-wake cycle, right? So while you're awake, lots of norepinephrine starts to drop off as you go into sleep, kind of bottoming out. Slightly different story here, right? With acetylcholine, we said, hey, big uptick of acetylcholine, right? During REM sleep, but not, that's not true for norepinephrine, right? Acetylcholine is more involved in cortical vigilance, cortical activity. Uh, norepinephrine doesn't have as big of a role in that, so we're not going to have that spike in norepinephrine levels that we would see with acetylcholine. Once you get back up, norepinephrine's back up as well, and you're going about your day doing your business. There you go, there's that blue place. You can see all of the places where we are sending acetylcholine. Hypothalamus is pretty important, or I'm sorry, uh, norepinephrine. Hypothalamus is pretty important, we'll talk about that guy a lot, uh, a little bit later today and in a couple weeks after the exam. <clears throat> all right, what about serotonin? Who loves serotonin? Everybody does, thank you. The hand raise there, right? Uh, serotonin, pretty important neurotransmitter, right? Uh, one of the most common neurotransmitter systems to be targeted if you're trying to treat, uh, you know, some sort of uh, mental health issue, right? Lots of folks take SSRIs, right? Which is going to increase your serotonin level. What's the number one side effect of an SSRI? You're sleepy, right? A lot of folks get sleepy on SSRIs. The reason is it's an increase in serotonin, right? So when you increase that serotonin, you get a little, a little bit sleepy. All right, don't need to worry about that too much. We'll talk briefly about histamine, right? Uh, this again helps promote wakefulness. Works with those other neurotransmitters, right? Uh, if you take an antihistamine. Uh, then you get a little sleepy. The last guy we want to talk about here is Rexin. And this is probably sort of one of the more important ones because it has an interesting sort of control mechanism. Kyle will talk about in a few moments when we look at this flip-flop circuit, these brain regions that are directly involved with control of sleep, right? Orexin is excitatory, right? So it's going to have an excitatory effect on those brain regions uh, where, it's, where it's released. And in rats, at least, while they're awake, uh, you seem to have a pretty high firing rate for orexinergic cells, cells that release orexin. And while they're asleep, uh, even during REM sleep, you seem to have a drop in that activity. So here you go. Uh, this, is a, this is a pretty, pretty clear-cut graph, right? You're awake, high levels of orexin. You're asleep, low levels of orexin, right? Just straightforward. Don't worry about that chart too much for this. All right. <clears throat> what we do want to think about is uh, some brain regions that are involved in this flip-flop circuit, right? And how these different neurotransmitters play a role in outside factors as well. So I'm going to show you a circuit for some brain regions, and we're going to add pieces to that, Bethany, as we go, right? So we're going to add some components here and there. Uh, this is going to involve uh, an area called the preoptic area. We'll talk about the ventral lateral preoptic area in particular and how these flip-flop circuits work uh, during, uh, 
sleep and wake. So here's just the basic flip-flop circuit, okay? You've got the sleep-promoting region out there in the ventrolateral preoptic area. These are your brainstem and forebrain arousal systems. We just talked about all of those, right? All of those brain regions that are going to release uh, these neurotransmitters, okay? Acetylcholine, norepinephrine, uh, serotonin, so forth. This is the concept of mutual inhibition. If the VLPOA is on, it is actively turning off the brain stem and forebrain, okay, those arousal systems. If those arousal systems are on, they are actively turning off the ventrolateral preoptic area, right? So there's that mutual inhibition, okay? When one's on, they're actively turning off the other. When the other's on, it's actively turning off the person. Okay? So this is the basic sort of system. Now, let's add something, right? Let's add something out here in the hypothalamus, okay? Specifically the lateral hypothalamus. I don't expect you guys to know that uh, just yet. The hypothalamus has about 30 different brain regions. Okay, we're not going to have to memorize all of those, but just no hypothalamus. You've got these orexinergic cells that are out there in the hypothalamus. Okay. They, again, are excitatory, and they project, project to those brainstem and forebrain arousal systems, right? So when they're active, they're going to actively project to that brainstem and forebrain regions, and they can promote that waking state. So they basically hold the flip-flop on, so they take that switch and just kind of hold it in the on position. And that's because we have some motivation to remain awake. We'll talk about what that is in just a moment. We can kind of add that. Right? So that motivation to remain awake is going to make those orexin neurons active. They're going to release orexin to the brain stem forebrain, and that's going to keep you awake. It's going to actively turn off the ventrolateral preoptic. Now, those neurons in that lateral hypothalamus that are resinergic, they actually receive inhibitory input from the ventrolateral preoptic area. So that sleep-promoting region is trying to turn off those resinergic neurons, right? Trying to turn those off so then you'll go to sleep. As you start to accumulate adenosine, even though you're maybe taking some caffeine, you've been to Starbucks eight times today, uh, right? Probably like, spent all your student loan money there. Uh, that's probably like $100 if you go to Starbucks eight times. I don't know how expensive it is. Coffee is setting the spawn. I don't know how you guys eat drink coffee. Anybody drink coffee on a regular basis? Yeah. I can tell when I go to drink Sam's. Poor choices. Uh, no, it's okay. So uh, once you get that accumulation of adenosine, right, it will eventually overwhelm those orexinergic neurons. Right? They'll eventually activate those adenosine receptors, shut those neurons down, because when those adenosine receptors become active, they start to become inhibited. Those cells stop firing, they stop releasing orexin, right? So it removes that activation from those brain stem and forebrain areas we've talked about, okay? and allows the ventrolateral preoptic area to then become active and inhibit those regions as well. Don't worry about that too much. You don't need to worry about this. Uh, for REM sleep, though, do keep in mind that um, cerebral metabolism is about the same as when you're awake. And we've already talked about that uh, if you're not paralyzed, you're actually going to get up and you're going to do things, right? You don't know what you're doing, and what you're doing is not connected to your own environment, so don't, don't like, try to bypass this process. And there you go. This is, uh, again, some other inputs to the lateral hypothalamus. Nothing you need to worry about. I'm not going to ask you about the specific rim flip-flop, uh, but keep in mind that there are some biological clock issues that feed into the erexinergic neurons. Hunger. How many of you have ever gone to sleep hungry? It's not an easy thing to do, is it? 
No. What's better is to eat a big turkey sandwich before you go to sleep. That's a fast way to sleep. Right, Casey? Uh, and if, again, if you are uh, uh, satiated, if you're full, you've just eaten, uh, or had some other sort of uh, satiety activity, you'll definitely be able to go to sleep much more easily. All right. So, Bethany, here's that whole thing squeezed together, right? It's not much, I know it's, it's like a lot, it's busy, right? But you only need to know a few things here. You want to start with these erexinergic neurons in the lateral hypothalamus. Know that they're trying to keep you awake. They're fighting to keep you awake. You keep making adenosine, you keep making it difficult on them, but they're fighting to keep you awake. Once that adenosine level gets so high, they're no longer able to stimulate that arousal system to keep you awake, and the ventrolateral preoptic area takes over, and guess what, you go to sleep. Okay? You go to sleep until you remove all of that adenosine that's been built up, and then those erectinergic neurons again are trying to wake you up, trying to get you going, and get those neurotransmitters dumped out into your brain. It's that simple. It's not so bad, right? <clears throat> uh, disorders of sleep, we can go through this pretty quickly. Uh, sleep apnea, I'm not going to ask you about that. Uh, cataplexy, that's kind of interesting. Uh, that's when you're awake and you become completely paralyzed. You know exactly what's going on, but you know. Uh, sleep paralysis, some people have probably experienced this, right? Um, and it actually, it's kind of, It'll kind of freak you out a little bit if you don't know what's going on, right? So this is when you're asleep, but you can't, well, you're not asleep, uh, but you can't move, right? Maybe you've just been asleep, you're just going to sleep, right? You're awake, you can't move, you feel like you can't breathe sometimes, like there's a giant, you know, sumo wrestler ghost sitting on your chest, uh, which is exactly what's causing it, uh, by the way, <coughs> in case you were curious. Uh, what happens here, Alex, is it's a disconnect between that um, paralysis part of REM sleep and you actually accidentally popping into being awake, right? So that paralysis hasn't totally washed out, but your brain said, hey, I'm gonna be awake anyway, right? You're kind of just like hanging out there for a few moments and you can't move. Just write it out, you're gonna be fine, right? Because it's just like you were in REM sleep except you're looking around with your eyes open. Often what happens during that time is folks make up fun stories about what's going on, right? Usually involves an invisible man trying to choke you, uh, right? That's a pretty, pretty reasonable explanation, Bethany. Uh, so, sleep paralysis is you've been asleep, right, or you're trying to go to sleep. Cataplexy is you're just like walking around doing your business and all of a sudden. Good question. Oh, let's see. Sleep behavior disorder, that's the fancy name for uh, you didn't get that REM paralysis like you thought you should. You started asking about your dreams. This, again, we've already sort of described that. This can cause damage to you and other people, right? So watch out for that. Sleep eating disorder, we talked about that as well. Most of the time they'll give folks uh, like uh, topiramate, right? Which is sort of an anti-seizure medication sometimes used for uh, migraines. Right? It's a dopaminergic agonist. It seems to, seems to work. Uh, so we give them a benzodiazepine, right? uh, try to avoid that if you can. Uh, benzodiazepines are great for about 30 seconds, and then you start using them longer than that, you should probably stop. I like to throw that out there. I see a lot of folks who've taken benzodiazepines for an incredibly long time, right? Uh, which a benzodiazepine, like, for more than a week is an incredibly long time, right? It's one of those things, like, I'm having a giant explosion in my brain right now, and I can't handle it, so we need to put you down for a few minutes. Uh, and then after that, you should probably like try something else. All right, who wants to talk about biological clocks? This is when you make uh, time pieces out of squirrels. That's another weird hobby. Uh, some of you may have. So we want to think about circadian rhythms, right? These are daily changes in your behavior or your physiological processes. We've talked about some of these, right? We talked about the rhythms of acetylcholine and norepinephrine, and we talked about some of these other sort of sleep-wake things that are going on, right? Uh, there are things called zeitgebers, right? This is a, uh, some sort of stimulus that's going to reset your circadian uh, rhythm, right? Reset that clock. What's a great thing you can use? Uh, happens every day. So far it has, anyway. Uh, that you could use to say like, hey, it's probably like a new day, uh, or like, hey, it's probably the end of the day. 
Yeah, it's the sun, right? It's like that big thing. I don't know if you guys ever get a look at it or not. It's outside. Kind of just like look up at it once in a while, make sure it's still there. Uh, the sun is probably one of the best, right? And a lot of folks have, have uh, you know, looked at day-night rhythms, uh, sleep and sleep-wake cycles, uh, hormone fluctuations throughout the day and things like that. Most of this information is going to something called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, right, of the hypothalamus. It's a mouthful of words. This guy sits right above the optic chiasm, right? So that's what it means, above the chiasm. We talked about that chiasm when we talked about the visual system. Information was coming back from your eyes and it crossed over. It's called the optic chiasm. This nucleus is right above that. I kind of sold you this story a long time ago about your uh, retina. And I said, hey, the only cells in there that are sensitive to light are the photoreceptors. I kind of lied to you there. I know, right, Megan? Why would I do that? I already wrote about it in my blog. You wrote about it in your blog. Yeah, well, that's going to be embarrassing. You have to <laughs> errata and then you have to just, like, fix that. Uh, there are also ganglion cells that are actually photosensitive. And that's weird because most ganglion cells are not. Remember, those are the first guys that fire action potentials. Some of those are actually, uh, they actually contain melanopsin, right? Which is, again, in those retinal ganglion cells. These cells project to that suprachiasmatic nucleus. They are great for saying, hey, the sun's up. You lazy bum, get out of bed. That's what they're good for. How many of you have room darkening curtains? There you go, right? Yeah, I got a set too. Uh, how many of you have a sleep mask? I use one of those too. Uh, just to you know, try to sleep longer. It doesn't usually work, but someone tends to wake me up much before I want to. So, this is why it's difficult for folks. Uh, any of you guys have ever worked like night shift, right? And you've had to like stay up all night and try to sleep during the day becomes difficult, right? Because you're constantly getting that light coming in. Even comes in through your eyelids, right? It comes in and says, hey, time to wake up. You know, it's getting into that suprachiasmatic nucleus in your hypothalamus. This guy, we'll talk about him a lot uh, in the next couple weeks. The hypothalamus is basically, <clears throat> it's basically in control of like all of the hormones that are released in your body, right? So everything that's going on, uh, the hypothalamus is sort of in charge of that. Questions about this? Casey, I didn't tell them not to take melatonin, did I? Should I tell them not to take melatonin? I think it's worth mentioning. You think it's worth mentioning? Again. Again? You think I mentioned it? Well, we'll see. Oh, you want me to tell them now? Yeah, this is a good time to tell you about melatonin. Don't raise your hand uh, when I ask who takes melatonin because I'm going to tell you why you shouldn't take melatonin and you're not going to want to have your hand up for that. Uh, the reason you don't want to take melatonin is there was a study a few years ago where they gave melatonin to mice and they saw that uh, melatonin decreased uh, gonadal size in mice. Yeah, so uh, I think most people want those whatever size they're supposed to be, right? Because uh, those are sort of important for certain things. <clears throat> Even if you've never seen your gonads, believe me, they're actually probably more important to you uh, if you've never seen them. Right, Casey? Because they control like a lot of things that happen. Uh, if, you, if you do get a peek at them once in a while, it probably just helps you grow like facial hair. It doesn't really do a lot else for you. If that doesn't make any sense to you in two weeks, hopefully it will. Uh, how many of you love rats? This is kind of cool. Uh, rats, by the way, are nocturnal. So they're typically active at night, so while you're sleeping, they're getting out, like, crawling around all over your food at home and getting up under your covers and scratching at your legs. Uh, you guys are going to sleep in a sleeping bag tonight. Just, like, zip that thing up. Nothing's getting in after me. You see, did I ever tell you we had a mouse live in our car for a while? It got up, like, yeah, somehow it got up in the, um, like, the cabin air filter, and it had made a nest, and it was, like, getting cat food and like dragging it up in there. We like live somewhere where there's like an outside cat like next door and, it, and we could never find it. So we had to, our oil changed like four or five times and it was like, there's like still a mouse next to this guy, no one knows. So rats are busy at night. Okay, so that's why the light's off. For us, it's sort of the opposite, right? Because we're diurnal, not nocturnal. 
What's interesting about this, if you shift the uh, night and dark on and off time a little bit, the rat will shift its activity accordingly, right? So if you turn off the lights a little sooner, the rat will go to bed a little sooner, right? If you turn on the lights a little later, the rat will get up later. What's interesting, if you sort of give them sort of like ambient light for, you know, for whatever, they'll actually have sort of a, a, a shift in their behavior patterns. So really, you can do this to people too. If you guys wanted to like live in a room with uh, just sort of low light levels, right? Nothing too high, nothing too low. Don't have clocks, you don't have any way to know what time it is. They'll actually sort of operate on a 25 hour cycle, right? It's slightly longer than the rotation of the planet. Uh, and so over time, you'll actually shift and drift a little bit. Uh, and so this guy's gonna get out of sync. But you need that, that's just telling you how important it is to have that, that sun come up and go down and give you that sort of reset every day, right? So there you go. Kyle back there's planning a, a remodel. Uh, at his house, <laughs> I'm going to create a room where I can drift my my circadian rhythms over time, right, over a few weeks. The other thing that's sort of interesting was a study a number of years ago, uh, because people always say, hey, you know, electric lights have really ruined us, right, because we don't sleep as much as we used to, back before, you know, people slept longer, people were healthier, right, so, like, so how do you actually determine if that's true? Well, you have to actually find some some sort of traditional hunter-gatherer societies that don't have electricity, right? And then you have to track them. And so a few years ago, uh, they gave, I think it was like 150, 200 people Fitbits uh, who were in these traditional societies. And so they measured their activity over the course of a year, right? How much did they sleep every night? When do they go to bed? When do they wake up? There's a lot of other activity they were monitoring as well. What was interesting is they found that they sleep about as much as anybody in sort of a a Western society with electric lights as well, right? The average sleeps about the same. So we're probably not sleeping less on average. I know some people are individually, but on average we're probably not sleeping less than what we used to. So Edison didn't kill us all. That's great. Uh, the second thing that was really interesting about that is they found that it wasn't necessarily just the sun coming up and going that was dictating when these individuals wake up or go to sleep. Some of it was temperature related as well. And so what they found was that uh, during the summer, these individuals would stay awake longer after sunset than they would in the winter, right, or in the cooler months, and then they would uh, actually wake up a little bit after sunset. Uh, you know, the sun had been up longer when they would wake up in the cooler months than uh, in the, in the uh, warmer months. So that temperature seems to be important as well. So if you want to sleep well, the colder you are, the better you'll sleep, right? If you get down to like, I don't know, seven or eight degrees Celsius, I think that's a pretty good sleeping temperature. Right, Megan? I mean, what is that? It's cold, right? Yeah. Get it down to zero, you'll never wake up. So, uh, cold, dark, great places to sleep. Uh, that's the super chiasmatic nucleus for anybody that's curious. You don't have to really think about that. We already talked about those retinal ganglion cells projecting back there to the hypothalamus. Brittany, we're just adding another layer here onto this awesome circuit that you loved, right? I'm sure you're gonna like, get a tattoo of this circuit somewhere, right? Right, right? right on the bicep, that's gonna be a great place right there. Huh? Collarbone, yeah, right? That's perfect, right? Uh, so again, we have these erexinergic neurons, right? So we have this information coming in, says what time of day it is. It's gonna activate those erexinergic neurons. It's gonna inhibit the ventrolateral preoptic area so we can get that arousal system turned on and you can wake up. <coughs> Not a big deal, right? Don't worry about that. Oh, there are sort of two uh, sleep syndromes. One's called advanced sleep phase and one's called delayed sleep phase syndrome, right? There are folks, uh, believe it or not, that uh, have extreme difficulty waking up like before 10 a.m. This is not because they're lazy. This is not because they stayed up all night playing video games, right? Although those are, those are a whole separate issue. Uh, these are folks that actually, uh, their biological rhythms are sort of shifted, right, a few hours. They also have difficulty going to bed early, right? So these are folks who can't go to bed usually before like 3 a.m. no matter what they try to do, right? So they're kind of on a, on a delayed uh, cycle. There are also folks who have advanced sleep phase syndrome, right? So these are folks, it's like 9 o'clock at night, and they're like, I'm going to sleep and then they wake up at like five in the morning, right? And it's not because that's a habit, it's not because that's, you know, job related, it's just these individuals, that's what they do. 
They cannot stay up late at night no matter what they try to do, however they try to bypass that. And they can't sleep any later during the day. So feel free to use either of these as appropriate for an excuse uh, for your behavior. Uh, it doesn't work for this class, that's why I teach afternoon classes, right? So if you're ever one of these you have, you should be awake and at your prime right now. But you can use it for your other classes, family obligations, things like that. Don't worry about this too much. And that's the end of the sleep chapter. Who's got questions?